Romans 14 verses 10 through 23. And the word of God today reads, But why dost thou judge thy brother? Or why dost thou set it not thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. For as it is written, As I live, saith the Lord, Every knee shall bow to me, And every tongue shall confess to God. So then every one of us shall give account of himself to God. Let us not therefore judge one another any more, but judge this rather, that no man put a stumbling block or, or an occasion to fall in his brother's way. I know and am persuaded by the Lord Jesus that there is nothing unclean of itself. But to him that esteemeth anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. But if thy brother be grieved with thy meat, thou now walkest thou not charitably? Destroy not him with thy meat, for whom Christ died. Let not then your good be evil spoken of. For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. For he that in these things serveth Christ is acceptable to God and approved of men. Let us therefore follow after, these, the, after the things which make for peace and things wherewith one may edify another. For meat destroy not the work of God. All things indeed are pure, but it is evil for that man who eateth with offense. It is good neither to eat flesh, nor to drink wine, nor anything whereby thy brother stumbleth, or is offended, or is made weak. Hast thou faith? Have it to thyself before God. Happy is he that condemneth not himself in that thing which he alloweth. And he that doubteth is damned if he eat, because he eateth not of faith, for whatsoever is not of faith is sin. Amen. It's a personal matter. If you bow your heads with me one more moment today. Father, once again, God, we bow our heads before you and we come humbly to you. God, the word of the Lord must go forth and there is no value in spoken words, even if they be based upon the Holy Scriptures, unless the anointing of the Holy Ghost is present, I'm weak in body, I'm tired today, God, I need the touch, the help, the anointing of the Holy Ghost. If I'm to be any blessing or any help to anyone at this time, Master, today, anoint the speaker, anoint the hearer, those in this room, those listening now and later by reason of the Internet, Allow us today, O oh God, to receive this word from the Lord as a message from heaven and not merely as the thoughts of men. For we need, O oh God, today to hear from you. We need today, O oh God, for our joy to be restored. We need today, O oh God, for truth to be exalted. For in truth there is liberty and freedom. We ask all this in that precious, sweet name, Jesus. Amen. Praise God and amen. I'm going to take my jacket off this afternoon because I'm already feeling like I'm wanting to burn up a little bit up here. Amen. It's a personal matter. 
Religion tries to generalize and make standard rules of conduct and rigid rules of conformity for all those who embrace that religion. But Christ Jesus lived, died, and rose again so that we could rise above religion and walk in relationship with God. Spirituality is about truth. It's about honesty and integrity. Religion merely seeks to make people conform to a code of conduct. Religion can be faked, but relationship cannot be faked, nor can it be counterfeited. If you are genuinely walking in relationship with the Lord, your life will reflect this truth. If not, your life will also reveal this reality. Amen? Amen. It's a personal matter. I'm here to tell you today, folks, Christianity over the last so many years has done an incredible job of twisting and perverting the pure, simple message of the Christian faith. The message of the Christian faith is that God revealed himself to humanity and he went to extraordinary lengths in order to provide us the opportunity to know him and to know him intimately. The truth of Christianity today is there are no standard rules that all Christians are bound to abide by. I, I was raised in the Pentecostal church. I'll tell you what, uh, every time you turned around, a preacher would get up and tell you something new. Oh, you should be praying at least an hour a day, every day. You ever heard a preacher preach like that? You know, and not everybody in the church has an hour a day. To, to devote to prayer. Not everybody has an hour a day. And not only should you be praying an hour a day, but you should be on your knees before the Lord. And they would have all these rules. And you should read your Bible at least this long every day. And then, of course, that's just the what you should do. Forget about the list of what you should do. You shouldn't smoke. You shouldn't drink. You shouldn't carouse. You shouldn't do this. You shouldn't do that. You shouldn't go to movies. You shouldn't go to dances. You shouldn't do... And man, I mean, there was a list a mile long of what you shouldn't do. Am I telling the truth? And there were all these standard rules. And if you're a Christian, you were judged by your conduct. And Christians sat around and... They sit in judgment of one another based on conduct, don't they? And the majority of what they're judging one another by is not what the Word of God demands we do or not do, but rather by what their denomination or their church or their pastor says we ought to do or not do. Why, if the denomination says you ought not to go to movies and somebody happens to be walking through the mall and they see another church member going in to see Star Wars, well, oh, oh, oh. oh the rumor mill is going to get to grinding and boy, I mean, it's going to get out. Did you see sister so-and-so going into the movie the other day? It doesn't matter what standard sister so-and-so applies to going to the movies. It doesn't matter if sister so-and-so will only go into a movie that uh, is clean and decent and family-friendly. You know, none of that matters because, after all, the rules of the denomination are that you're not to go to the movies, period. It doesn't matter what. But Paul talks in Romans chapter 14 about the very personal nature of our walk with God. 
And he articulates very clearly that every believer is going in the end to answer to God for themselves. Johnny, you'll not answer for me and I will not answer for you. <coughs> Therefore, it is folly for me to get in on your walk with God. It's foolishness for me to try to tell someone else what they can or cannot do if they're to be a child of God. It's foolishness. Because in the end, my input will have absolutely no part in the judgment whatsoever. We all will stand personally, intimately responsible to God for ourselves. One of the most important statements that the Apostle Paul ever made in his writings is found in Romans chapter 14. And verse number 13, Let us not therefore judge one another anymore. That, that sounds like a pretty clear statement, doesn't it? Yeah. He said, But judge this rather, that no man put a stumbling block or an occasion to fall in his brother's way. You know, it never ceases to amaze me how many so-called Christian people, I say so-called because I'm not convinced today that they are in truth Christians. I think they are Christian in name only. I think they're Christian in profession only. But I do not believe for one minute that they are Christian in truth. But it never ceases to amaze me how many so-called Christian people will jump in and begin to offer their two cents to another believer because that other believer thinks it's okay to do this or thinks it's okay to do that or thinks it's okay to consume this or thinks it's okay to go here or to go there. And because... Sister Jones doesn't think it's okay to do that. She'll jump on Sister Smith like there's no tomorrow. And she will go out of her way to convince Sister Smith that she's hell-bound in a handbasket because she allows herself to do this or to go there or to eat this. How many of us in the LGBT community who are striving to live for God today know the pain and the sting of someone jumping on us and letting us know you cannot be a Christian and be who you are. You cannot be a Christian and do what you do. And they don't think anything in the world, Johnny, of convincing you that you're wrong and you're lost and grace does not apply to you because of that, <coughs> excuse me, which you allow. Paul said, let's not judge one another anymore. He said, but judge this, that no man put a stumbling block or an occasion to fall in his brother's way. I'll tell you something, whether I agree or whether I disagree with what another believer thinks is acceptable before God, the last thing in the world I want to do is say or do anything that might cause that person to simply give up their walk with God altogether. That's right. It's amazing to me, there is no floor. There is no bottom line. There is no base or a foundation that people can go to and say, well, if this individual at least embraces this, then whatever else they may do, whatever else they may say, whatever else they may allow, I don't want to discourage them from this. There's no bottom line in the mind of most Christians today. Now, I've said many times, I believe in the apostolic way. I'm a preacher of the apostolic message. <coughs> I believe it's the right way. I believe it's the biblical way. If 
But I've also said on many occasions that we need to be careful when we address someone who perhaps is Episcopalian or someone who is perhaps Presbyterian or Baptist or Methodist or Lutheran. We need to be careful that we do not try to take away from them the fact that they genuinely believe in the life, the death, the burial, the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's an important foundation. That's an important chunk of our faith. If you don't have that, then the rest of it is, is worthless to you. You must first believe in the death, the burial, the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ if you have any hope of being saved. So why in the world would I approach someone who comes from a different faith background or faith tradition and try to convince them that they have nothing because they don't have everything. Hello now. Right. Why would I do that? I can't do that. The Word of God tells me, don't let's not sin in judgment of one another. That's not to say because you reserve judgment does not mean you agree. There are a lot of things that I don't see anything about that I just keep my mouth shut. And it does not imply or denote that I'm in agreement with those things. It just means that I reserve judgment. I'm not going to open my big trap because I don't want to become embroiled in someone else's issue, someone else's matter. I've told people many times, if homosexuality is not your issue, if that is not an issue that you live with, then guess what? God don't care. Preacher don't care. Christian don't care what your opinion is on that subject. If it's not an issue that you're living with, honey, it don't matter if you have an opinion on that issue. True. Got news for you. If you're not making a decision about an abortion, then guess what? Nobody in the universe, including God himself, gives a happy hallelujah what your opinion on abortion is either. That's right. The only people, Johnny, that God cares about their opinion on these issues are people who are facing these issues. People who are living with these issues. People who have to make real, substantive decisions concerning these issues. If that does not include you, then keep your mouth shut. Mm -hmm. If it does not involve you, then your opinion is neither desired nor necessary. Oh, but I might help someone to do the right thing. Really? To do the right thing by who? That's right. Mm-hmm. To do the right thing by who? To do the right thing by your standard? To do the right thing by your conviction? To do the right thing by your belief? Honey, I got news for you. If I do something because it's the right thing by your belief, then guess what? I don't get any credit for it in heaven either. Because they had nothing to do with me. I was not acting on my conviction. I was not acting on my belief. I was not acting on that which I was convinced of. No, I was acting on your conviction. I was acting on your belief. I was acting on what you convinced me of. How many LGBT believers today are outside of church and away from God, not because in their own heart they're condemned by God, not because in their own heart God has abandoned them or God has turned his back on them, but because they've allowed themselves to be convinced by somebody else. Now listen, here's the sickening part. Somebody else who's not even living that issue. Absolutely. And they've allowed that person's conviction, that person's belief, that person's thought process to determine the direction for their lives. I'm going to tell you something, folks. There are a lot of 
people and they're going to wind up in a devil's hell. Yeah, this preacher said it. They're going to wind up in a devil's hell because they did not understand that our walk with God is a personal matter. Amen. They were too busy allowing other people to dictate to them what they should believe. They were too busy allowing other people to tell them what they should do and what they shouldn't do and what they could be and what they couldn't be. They were too busy allowing other people to define for them the boundaries of grace. This is probably the biggest lesson that I had to learn when I came into affirming ministry, literally. The hardest lesson... God brought me down through the issue of grace. And I mean, I had to relearn grace all over again. I, I had to literally throw everything I'd ever been taught about grace out the window. And I had to study it and study it and study it. And I did for a very long time. So I could understand grace again from a biblical perspective. But you know what? That wasn't the hardest part of my journey in coming into affirming ministry. The hardest part of my journey in coming into affirming ministry was finally getting it through my thick skull that it doesn't matter what Franklin Graham says. It doesn't matter what Rod Parsley says. It doesn't matter what Jimmy Swaggart says. God and I are in this thing alone, and only God and I can work out the details of my salvation. Hello now. The Word of God said, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. This is a personal matter. It doesn't matter what others' opinions. It took a long time, Johnny. We live our lives as human beings constantly seeking to be part of a pack somewhere. You know, we want to be accepted. We want to be approved of. We want somebody somewhere to accept us and to approve of our choices and to approve of our beliefs. It's an awful hard thing to come to the place in your walk with God where you couldn't give a fig what anybody else thinks. Where you couldn't care less what anybody else believes. That was the hardest part of my coming into affirming ministry. To this day, I've said it before, I'll say it again. I get people send me emails all the time, you know. Uh, I got some foolish people actually waste a stamp to send me a letter in the mail. And boy, they're going to set me straight. They're going to let me know what the Bible really says. You know, as if I haven't spent time investigating these issues. And I'll begin to read the letter. I'll begin to read the email. And the minute I hit a word or a line that helps me to know the tenor of that message, delete, tear it up, throw it away. Well, preacher, you don't even read it. Why should I? I could care less about what it has to say. I don't give a flying fig about one word they have to say. That person means nothing to me. That person has no business getting involved in my walk with God. That person has no business trying to help me understand things the way they understand things. If you believe it's wrong, then according to Romans chapter 14, you better not do it! If you believe that it is wrong, if you believe that uh, it is something that is not allowed by the Word of God, then you had better not do it. Amen? Amen. Amen. But you are not given license anywhere in the process to dictate to others whether or not that same thing is wrong for them. Yeah. It's a personal matter. There are some people who can believe God for a healing this fast. 
There are some people every time they get sick, they turn to the Lord. And I mean God touches them and they're healed in a moment's notice. And then there are other people who because of their emotional makeup, because of their tolerance for pain and discomfort, uh, sometimes they get kind of side-whacked by sickness and illness. And sometimes it kind of knocks them off track for a while. And it takes them a while before they're finally able to kind of focus on the Lord and touch the Lord and receive something from heaven. I know people who condemn Others who aren't able to believe God for a miracle this fast, they condemn them as being faithless and they condemn them as not walking with God as they ought to be walking with God because after all, I can touch the Lord at a moment's notice when I need to. Well, that's all well and good, but it's a personal matter. Your walk with God is not my walk with God. I'm going to tell you, when I got sick this this past uh, couple of weeks and I wound up in the hospital. Uh, this doesn't happen to me a whole lot, but for some reason I was so sick and so miserable and in such pain and in such discomfort that it literally just kind of knocked me right off the train track. All of a sudden, I've got to be honest with you, my mind wasn't even on God. My mind, but I wasn't even thinking about turning to God. I, I wasn't even thinking about praying. I was so miserable and so uncomfortable that I was kind of stuck in the moment. You know what I'm talking about? You ever been stuck in the moment? Yes. I got out of the hospital last week and finally, after a few days, I, I had some things to do and I ventured out to the car and I got in my van and I turned it on and I started driving down the road and I put one of my DVDs in to my little DVD player. And I got some people, Holy Ghost filled Pentecostal people on the DVD singing some songs that I love, you know. And all of a sudden they started singing and all of a sudden my mind kind of got back to where it ought to have been. All of a sudden, I begin to focus on the Lord a little bit more. I begin to get a little bit more on track. And I begin to feel the presence of the Lord in that car. And I told Tommy, I said, do you know what? When I got in this car the other day and I turned on that music, I immediately began to, I said, I immediately began to feel better. I immediately began to feel better. But you know, there are times when... We get stuck in our flesh, and we get buried in our flesh. That's why the Word of God said, Paul said, Stir up the gift that is within thee by the laying on of hands of the presbytery. He said, Stir up the gift that's in you. Why? Because sometimes it gets buried. Sometimes it's not accessible because all kinds of crud and junk builds up on top of it. It's kind of like skin on gravy, you know? If you're going to get at the gravy, you've got to scrape the skin off, right? Yep. If you're going to get at the usable stuff, you got to get rid of the unusable stuff. Well, that's what happens to us. But I know people, if you go through periods like that, I know Christian people who will just be convinced you're backslid and you're not as spiritual as you ought to be because after all, you, I don't ever go through periods like that. I hate to say this, but I'm kind of reaping what I've sown over the years. I remember as a young person, a young Christian, I remember hearing preachers talk about going through long, dark, dry valleys. And they would talk, I mean, sometimes I heard preachers talk about pastoring churches, Johnny. And they went through valleys that lasted a decade. And they said, for a decade, I was so uh, discouraged and I was so despondent. And every day, every Sunday, it took everything I had to get up in the pulpit and preach. And I sat there as a young person and I thought, well... I don't know what was wrong with you, bless God, because I ain't never gone through a valley like that. My walk 
with God is so spiritual and so close. Guess what, baby? I found that valley. <laughs> I found that valley, and I've been walking it a whole lot longer than 10 years. And I understand now what they were talking about but how easy it was for me back then to sit in judgment of their experience with God. How easy it was for me back then to sit in judgment of their walk with God. Folks, I'm here to tell you today, Christianity is not about a general set of applied rules and regulations. Any religion that comes at you with that mindset is a lying sack of mud. It's garbage and you need to throw it away. No, what the preacher of the gospel is supposed to do is to help us understand that our walk with God is a personal matter and that we ought to take it very seriously. Just because it's personal doesn't mean that we should take it lightly or carelessly, amen? No, we need to take it very seriously. We need to be mindful of the repercussions of carelessness and thoughtlessness. A lot of people go through life and, and they take the attitude, well, my walk with God is between God and I, and, and I'll just do anything I want to do, and I'll just say anything I want to say, and I'll just approach things any old way I want to approach things. Um, no, that's a little careless. <coughs> that's a little careless. You need to be mindful. Yes, it's personal, but that means you should personally be seeking the Lord concerning the issue at hand. Amen? I'm going to tell you a little secret before you come to me and preach me a message on whether or not a person can be LGBT and Christian or not. You spend as much time investigating this issue as I have. Then come talk to me. Well, I don't need to investigate it because after all, I've been in church my whole life and I've heard preachers say, bum, 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 bum. Honey, I grew up in a church that said you were going to hell in a handbasket if you were divorced or remarried. Now half the people in the church as well as half the people in the pulpit are divorced or remarried. Don't tell me that you know the truth. Don't tell me that you know exactly what the Bible says on these issues just because you've been hearing somebody preach at you for years. And years and years. Hello now. Got news for you folks. There's a lot of things been preached in the church for years and years and years and years that are not true and are not right and are not accurate. And if you're going to find your way with God, if you're going to find a walk with God that works, then you better find out from the Lord how He feels about that issue. Amen. And how that issue applies to you. Trying to bring it to a close today, I'll tell you, uh, there are certain Pentecostal denominations today that preach that men are to have clean-shaven faces. You cannot have a mustache. You cannot have a beard. You cannot have a goatee. You can have no facial hair on your face whatsoever because, after all, that is God's standard of holiness. That is a pile of crap. That is pure garbage. And then they'll go into Johnny explaining why men wear mustaches and beards. Well, it's vanity. It's all about vanity. Really? That's funny because I know several men that wear beards. Doesn't have a thing in the universe to do with vanity. It has to do with ease of care. They just can't stand having to constantly shave and constantly have... <laughs> my my great-uncle, he's in his 80s now, and he wears a beard. He never used to wear a beard in his younger days, but he does now. Why? Because it's so much easier for him than having to try to shave his old wrinkled-up face. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. But to hear these preachers tell it, why well, they knew why every man on the planet wore a beard or every man on the planet wore a mustache, and it had to do with vanity had to do with appearances. You see how they generalize? You see how they try to make these rules that apply to everybody? 
Folks, I'm here to tell you today, it's a personal matter. Amen. You don't need to work your salvation out with the pastor of the church you grew up in. You don't need to work your salvation out with your mother or your dad. You don't have to work your salvation out with that TV preacher. And if you're even letting them in on the negotiations, then you are the one who's at fault. It's not their fault that you let them into your thinking. It's not their fault that you let them into your head. No, when you stand before God in the judgment and you wind up being cast into outer darkness where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth, and you say, but Lord, this one said this, and this one said that. The Lord's going to look at you and say, yeah, but uh, on Sunday, the 2nd of June, 2019, I had you stop and listen to this little preacher in Texas, and he helped you to understand that it's a personal matter. Amen. Right. That your walk with me didn't have anything to do with them. That it's not about general rules and general regulations. It's a very personal thing. What may be right for some may not be right for you. There are some issues that for me it might be vanity that motivates me. And yet that very same thing, vanity doesn't play into it at all for you. Am I telling the truth? Right. Amen. Right. So understand today, believer, whatever... Your struggle, whatever you're fighting with, what, whatever people want to come at you. I'm going to tell you, Satan loves to use people to try to discourage us right out of the faith. And if you don't understand today it's a personal matter, you'll let them win. You'll let it work. I've had more people say to me, well, bless God, I quit church, I quit going to church, I quit being a Christian because of the way them people acted, because of things that people said. Really? And you think when you stand before God in the judgment, that excuse is going to fly. You really think the Lord's going to say, okay, well, I'll let you into heaven because after all, those people discouraged you. No. So then every one of us shall give account of himself to God. Amen. I love what Paul said closing. I love what he said in verse number 14. I think it's verse number 14. I know, I know, I know. That means he is fully convinced and am persuaded by personal feelings. Oh, no. Mm. By the Lord Jesus. My goodness. Paul said, I know this and I'm persuaded of this by the Lord Jesus. Listen to this, believer. That there is nothing unclean of itself. That's not what the Jehovah's told me. They told me that smoking was unclean. They told me dipping tobacco was unclean. They told me, Paul said, that there is nothing unclean, that there is nothing unclean of itself. What determines whether or not that thing be unclean? Listen, but to him that esteemeth anything to be unclean, to everyone in the church, it is unclean. Oh, no, that's not what it says. It says, to him, it is unclean. If you believe abortion to be wrong, then baby, you better not get an abortion. If you believe homosexuality is wrong, then baby, you better not live as a homosexual. If you believe that drinking and smoking is wrong, then honey, you better not drink and smoke. I can't drink and smoke. I can't do it. I cannot do it. Now, do, do I believe everybody that puts a cigarette to the lips or everybody that has a drink is going straight to hell simply because they've done so? No. But for me, I believe that those things are taboo. I, I don't want anything to do with them. I feel, that, and, and God probably knows my personality. I may be the kind of person who gets addicted at the drop of a hat, you know. So he's keeping me, you know, seriously, you know. That may be why the Lord tells you something that's not good for you. 
And, and the other guy can do it. Well, that's because they can have one and quit. You and me have one, and next thing you know, we're laying out in the gutter singing, you know, oh, my papa. <laughs> Amen. That's right. So understand today, stop living under a cloud of doubt. Stop living under a cloud of condemnation. Stop letting others determine your walk with God. And understand today this simple truth. It's a personal matter. Amen. Would you stand with me this afternoon? Praise.